the politics of algorithms. What do they have to do with one another? An algorithm is a mathematical description of a computational process for mapping some inputs to some outputs. It is a very platonic object. Uh, what does it have to do with the vagaries and um, discretionary aspects of human politics? Well, it turns out in the concept of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, I'm mostly going to be talking specifically about Bitcoin, um, a lot. Um, and in order to, to see why, I want you to think about uh, Bitcoin and, and to talk about Bitcoin as this mass-based cryptocurrency, a cryptocurrency backed by mathematics and there's algorithms. And I would like to clear the misconception that this is only mathematics and this is only algorithms. There is a human element. These are human systems with human politics and they are of primary importance in those networks. But before I get into that, um, the Kinesian Kitty contest. So, uh, and I swear this is actually going to be relevant. I'm not just trying to show you cat pictures. Uh, we're going to play a little game. Uh, and in that game, I'm going to show you nine fluffy pictures. And, and, and you have to pick the cutest one. Now, this is a positive sum game, so we can all be winners tonight. Um, th there's one issue with that I don't know which one is the cutest one. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick whichever one most people select, and that's going to be the cutest one. And so in order for you to win tonight, you have to pick the same picture that you expect most people are going to pick. This is how you win a Kinesian contest. So without further ado, uh, here's the kittens. And uh, we, have a, uh, we have a special entrant tonight. This is going to date me, but uh, number five is Alf. He's a character from an NBC's uh, 80s sitcom, and he really likes cats. So um, you have nine entrants, and you have to pick a number. And once again, if you want to win, uh, you have to pick the number you expect most people are going to select. So I'm just going to give you a few seconds to think about that. All right, so just by show of hands, do we have anyone who selected kitten number six, the cute kitten with the flowers? Okay, I see a couple of hands here. All right, that's good. Uh, and I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Uh, has anyone selected ALF number five? <laughs> All right, okay. So the reason that uh, ALF can be a winner, even though he's not even a kitten, and even though he's not particularly that cute, uh, is simply that he is a shelling point. So Schelling Point were introduced by economist Thomas Schelling in the 1960s. And the idea is that if you have a game where humans need to coordinate on something and they have a hard time communicating or maybe communication is expensive, they are going to find a solution. And that solution is going to be something that seems reasonable to them or natural. And here, the natural answer is the middle one. It's, it, it's obvious even though he's not necessarily cute and he's not necessarily a, a kitten. So, uh, how does that relate to Bitcoin? So, uh, you know, we've talked about Bitcoin, it's uh, this cryptocurrency. One of the uh, most uh, impressive aspects of Bitcoin is, is its growth. In 2010, it took 10,000 Bitcoin for purchasing two pizzas. Uh, today, this would be worth around $50 million. So, crazy price appreciation. But what I find fascinating is the talk around Bitcoin between, I would say, 2009 and 2013, 14, where it was really in the context of the U.S. financial crisis, and everyone is contrasting it with uh, human politics. So you have all of these discretionary actions from the U.S. Federal Reserve, from the U.S. Treasury, uh, and, and in contrast of that, Bitcoin is supposed to be this island of pure mathematics where you know, nothing gets in the way of the algorithm. It's completely independent from human affairs. And you see it in the memes at the time um, that kind of reflects the, um, the zeitgeist. So here, Bitcoin, your money is secured by the laws of the universe. Uh, so you know, here it makes the case that it would take the entire energy of a star and some type of sci-fi technology if we ever wanted to, uh, to break Bitcoin. And you know, one, that's probably not true. And, and two, um, it's, you know, it's really making the point that this is really the laws of physics which are backing this. But, you know, what's stronger than the laws of physics? The laws of mathematics. So, you know, Bitcoin is mass versus government. It's a currency built with mathematics. If you go on Bitcoin.org, it will tell you that Bitcoin is backed by mathematics, which normally would mean that you should be able to exchange one Bitcoin from one mathematics, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, now, one particularity of Bitcoin, which is uh, rather well known now, is that Bitcoin can have at most 21 million coins. It's not 22, it's not 20, uh, it's, 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 it's this number. 
And if you look at this number, it's clearly a human chosen number, right? They are special number in mathematics and like 800 x x decillion. Uh, they're special numbers in physics. 21 million is human chosen. And it could have been 42, it could have been 210. And that wouldn't make a big difference. The only difference it would make would be the same thing as if you're counting in dollars versus cents. So that doesn't make a big difference. But somehow, the network enforces that. Now, it's not the laws of mathematics which are going to be enforcing this human chosen number. It's not the laws of physics. The reason that Bitcoin can have 21 million coin and not 22 is that if I create my own version of Bitcoin and I come to you and I say, hey, I have this new version of Bitcoin, it just so happens that it has different rules. Well, you're not going to accept it. You're going to say, that's not Bitcoin. That's not, that's not in a rule set that we all agreed upon. And so the value of a Bitcoin to you is predicated on the propensity of other people to actually accept it. And so the mechanism that enforces this type of properties on the network is the same mechanism that means that everyone is going to pick a certain picture in a contest. It's based on a shilling point and it's based on a human and very political decision. Now, it can be stable, it can work, like Bitcoin is working, Bitcoin has been doing fantastically, but it's a misconception to assume that this is enforced by mathematics. Mathematics is a backbone, but in the end, it's a human system. So the French, this is uh, Michel Foucault, he's a French uh, post-structuralist, and the post-structuralists would tell you that everything is a social construct. Mathematics is a social construct, physics is a social construct. And I don't think they're right, or if they are, they're right in some trivial sense. Um, but for Bitcoin and for money and cryptocurrencies in general, I think they would be right in an interesting sense. Yes, Bitcoin has algorithms and yes, it has mathematics, but in the end, what really makes the network is the social construct around it. It's the shared uh, vision that a lot of people have using this network of saying, yes, we are going to ascribe value to this, and yes, we're going to go by this set of rules and not by any other set of rules. This is what actually makes Bitcoin. So, why does any of this matter? Why do, you know, why do we care if it's working? You know, why, why make this distinction? Is this just uh, pedantry on my part? Well, not quite. So it gets interesting when you look at innovation. So Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin paper came out in 2008, network launched in 2009. There's been a lot of innovation since then because obviously academics saw this great innovation and they started working at it and there were a lot of um, proposals. So here's just three I like. Uh, one is called Bitcoin NG. Uh, it's an academic proposal for increasing the throughput, that's the amount of transactions per second for Bitcoin, about 10x to 100x. Uh, you know, no one's talking about it. Uh, Zero Cash was an academic paper. It gave rise to a cryptocurrency called Zcash now, which preserves privacy. It turns out that if you make a transaction in Bitcoin, the entire world can see it. So that's, you know, that's an interesting development. Or uh, Ethereum, which uh, implemented smart contracts, which are these electronic agreements that can be enforced in the same way that the network enforces transactions. Uh, if you go to uh, Archive, which is uh, the largest repository of uh, scientific paper now, you'll see there's a you know, great increase of uh, papers mentioning Bitcoin. So there's a lot of active research. Why does it matter? Well, unless Bitcoin was perfect from inception, you might want to change the rule sets. You might want to make the rule sets better because you have new ideas. But how do you do this? Let's say that we were all uh, on focus on number five, and all of a sudden we say, actually, you know what, we would be better off having chosen number six, right? How do you actually move that shilling point? Well, there's two ways we can do it. One way is I'm on stage, I could tell everyone, hey, everyone, you know, everyone pick number six, and we're going to win by picking number six. And because I, I have a microphone, I have a loud voice, maybe I'm able to do that. Or we can try to have these informal discussions, but it's, it's a messy process. And what typically happens when you try to have innovation in the system is something called a fork. So the idea of a fork is that you start with one system, and then someone say, hey, you know what, we should move from ALF, and we should, you know, we should move to kitten number six, because that's, you know, that's clearly a better idea, and, and, and we'll be better served. And some people are going to say, yes, you know what, six is a good idea, six is legitimate, this is what we should all be focusing on. But other people will say, no, actually, I prefer the other version. And so the value that was in your network is now going to be split into two. One part of that value is going to go to um, the people who are looking at one network as, as legitimate and the other to the other network. And it's not going to be exactly zero, one, because there's always uncertainty, things can happen. So typically when you see forks, it's tended to be something like 10%, 90% historically. But it's still, one is going to capture most of the value. Now, 
what do they capture the value best, uh, based on? Is it the best fork who is going to win? Is it the fork that's the most obvious? I would argue that, at least right now, the main criterion for picking a fork is legitimacy. And uh, as a use case, there's been a debate raging in the Bitcoin community for about a year and a half now on the size of blocks. So as you may know, Bitcoin is based on a blockchain, which is this data structure that produces a block uh, every about 10 minutes. And blocks have traditionally been this one megabyte files that contain transaction. Now, there's been one faction in the Bitcoin community who's been saying, hey, if, we on if only we had bigger blocks, then we could have more transactions, and it, it, this would be great because we need to have more transactions. Well, the other side has been saying, well, you know, that may be true, but if we do that, um, our network is going to be less decentralized. Some parties are going to have more influence than others. And what I find fascinating is that in a lot of this debate, both sides were quoting Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous founder of Bitcoin to each other. Now, Satoshi has not been seen online for the past few years, but they were saying, hey, clearly, in the vision of Satoshi, we need to have big blocks. And the other one would say, no, 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 clearly, look at this. Uh, clearly, we should have small blocks. And so they're engaging in this whole hermeneutics for weird reasons. So one possible reason might be that it's simply argument from authority. They're saying, well, Clearly, Satoshi knew what they were doing, and so they would have a good opinion on the matter. But there's also a lot of very smart people looking at Bitcoin. There's a lot of very smart opinion. So I don't think this is what's happening. What's happening is a play for legitimacy. It's two sides saying, I'm the legitimate branch, and so I want to take the economic value with me. Whereas the other side said, no, 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 no. We're the legitimate branch. We should have the value. Now, we've moved completely away from algorithm. We've moved away from mathematics. But what's going to determine the rules of this ledger is the interpretation of the, of the writing of a paper written nine years ago. This is, this is completely the realm of politics, and the human element is nothing to do with algorithm, it's nothing to do with math. Um, the dynamic at play between those groups is sadly captured in a game known as the game of chicken. So again, this is going to date me, this is James Dean, Rebel Without a Cause. And so in a game of chicken, you have two cars, and they're racing towards each other, and you win the game by not swerving, because the other side, who is slightly less crazy than you, is going to swerve before. Uh, and, and the problem with a game like this is that if both sides are you know, equally unwilling to swerve, they may just crash um, uh, towards one another. So you have the same dynamic at play in a fork, because you may not want to fork. You don't want to divide the, the network, what you primarily want, is you want to steer it. But you're going to try to convince the other side that no matter what, you're going to try to, you know, you're, you're, you're going to go your own way. No matter what, you're going to keep going in a straight line. And both sides do that. And it's really not an effective way of doing governance. So what I've been working on is formalized governance uh, for blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And so, just a word about governance. So one way to think about it is imagine you own an apartment building, uh, not an apartment, a bil uh, an apartment in an apartment building. So you own your apartment, everything you do in your apartment is your own business, I don't care, the neighbors um, hopefully don't care. Uh, but what happens when you need to decide when the heat should be turned on for the building, or should the, fa should the facade of the building be repainted? You need a way of making these decisions which are going to engage the common parts of the building. And in order to do that, you need to have governance. Now, we have several options. Um, you can do nothing. You can say, we don't like governance, we don't want to have governance, we own our apartment and that's enough, and that may be fine, but then the paint is going to chip on your facade and you're not going to have heat in your building in the winter, that's not that great. Um, you could try not having any process and just letting whoever yells the loudest uh, make those decisions, but again, it's still going to engage your resources, that's not necessarily what you want. So what can we do? Well, instead of having all these informal processes, we can formalize. We can create rules for saying we have common parts, and there are common parts in blockchains, uh, one, you know, the most important of which being innovation. So we all agree that we need to innovate, we need to introduce uh, sometimes changes in our platform, but if we're going to do that, we need to have a process, because if we don't have a process, it's going to be determined by completely random means that have to do with shelling points instead of having to do with merits. So one simple way of doing this is simply voting. You can have, you know, blockchains are great records uh, keepers. They're a great way of coordinating action. And so you can have a vote. You can say to people, okay, we're going to have a new proposal for innovation 
Do you actually want to do this? And it's very important for people to be able to express their intention without having to try to guess what other people are doing. You want people to tell them, this is what I prefer and not this is what I expect everyone else is going to prefer. Now, it's a, very, it's, it's a subtle distinction, but it makes a whole world of difference. So if I just want to leave one idea, one important idea tonight is that, yes, there are algorithms uh, at play, there are mathematics, but in the end, we're dealing with human systems, right? Uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchains, they are social construct. The algorithm is just a scaffolding upon which you flesh out all of these human activities. So when designing the systems, think about the human element. Don't think of them purely as technology. Think of them as enablers of social structure. And only through that will we be able to really leverage the coordinating abilities of blockchains and related technologies.